Man, thank you, praise team, so much. I love that song. I did that a few weeks ago in second service and thrilled to have them here in first service this morning. And I saw Dean Merrifield dancing back there in the aisle. Well done, Dean. Oh, you still got the moves, my friend. We are finishing up our series in Thessalonians, so if you'll join me in your copy of God's Word, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're looking at uh, verses towards the end of that chapter. We're going to begin reading in just a moment in verse 6, but we're coming to our conclusion, as I mentioned this morning, our six-week journey that we have taken through First and 2 Thessalonians and I have so enjoyed study and, and preparation. I hope that uh, it has been a meaningful journey for you and uh, we have learned together. Next Sunday, the last Sunday of November, can you believe that? Uh, got a special Thanksgiving message for us as we move towards the Thanksgiving holidays. And then beginning in December, I'll do a three-week series uh, on a study called Unto Us. Going to be looking at passages out of Isaiah. Our uh, Summit Praise Choir will be bringing... Uh, their Christmas program one of those Sundays, and then the last Sunday of the year, I'll kind of have a wrap-up uh, sermon uh, for 2019 as we look into 2020. So that's a brief synopsis of where we're headed these next several Sundays. An oxymoron is not a person. It is a combination of contradictory words that are linked together, and we use a number of them. The plural uh, term for oxymoron is oxymora. And so I want to give you a few oxymora this morning. You know these, you, you use them. Jumbo shrimp would be an oxymora. Pretty ugly would be an oxymora. Working vacation, some of you do that. Tight slacks would be an oxymora. Microsoft Works, think about that for a moment, would be an oxymoron. But, but here's one that we're really going to focus in on this morning, lazy Christian. You see, some people think that the Bible is merely a collection of old stories, children's stories even of sorts, you know, Jonah and the fish and Noah and the ark. But those of us who know and love the Bible, the, the Word of God, the teaching of God, it's so much more than just stories. It's a practical guide for how we live the Christian life. Everything you need to know about life is found in the passages of this great book. For instance, our passage, our text this morning speaks about the importance of working hard at a job. And so since most of us have a job or have had a job or will have a job, I think there's some practical advice for everyone in the room this morning. The theme of this series in Thessalonians has been faith in uncertain times. And it is our faith and hope that is found in Jesus Christ that, that helps us through those uncertain times. Our feet is on the rock, as the praise team saying. And specifically, this morning, Paul encourages the believers in Thessalonica to hold on to their faith because Jesus is going to return. But apparently... There were some of those believers who missed the point of the message. They thought that if Jesus is going to re return soon, then, then the only thing I have to do is wait around for him re to return. If he's coming back tomorrow, why work today? I, I need to be ready for tomorrow. So they became oxymora. They became lazy Christians. And you see, to be a real Christian, you cannot be a lazy person. So Paul concludes his letter, this second letter to Thessalonians, with some strong language, some strong words about the dangers of laziness, but also the value of a good, hard work ethic. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading in verse 6. 
Paul writes, now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother or sister who is idle and does not live according to the tradition received from us. For you yourselves know how you should imitate us. We were not idle among you. We did not eat anyone's food free of charge. Instead, we labored and toiled, working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. It is not that we do not have the right to support, but we did it to make ourselves an example to you so that you would imitate us. Verse 10, in fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone is not willing to work, he should not eat. For we hear that there are some among you who are idle. They are not busy, but busy bodies. Now we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and provide for themselves. But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for the joy and the privilege, the opportunity to be together in corporate worship this morning, a day to come and celebrate all of what you have done, are doing, and will do. And God, this morning, I pray that these verses and this, this scripture that we love so much would come off the page and that it would be something that we truly learn from and apply in our lives. And I pray, Father, in these next few moments that you would teach us the importance of working until you return. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. From the very beginning of the church, Jesus has encouraged the church to be sensitive to the needs of the hungry and the poor. And so we, we take it very serious when Jesus talks about feeding the hungry and, and clothing the naked. Howard prayed that just a moment ago in our offertory prayer. Matthew 25, verse 40, Jesus says, whatever you do for the least of these brothers of mine, you've done unto me. And so the first crisis in the church in Jerusalem was caused by how the food was distributed to the poor and specifically to the poor widows. So the church has always been an aid station for the hungry and the poor. But a problem arises in the church when there are people who can work but choose not to work because they know someone else from the church will step up and do it. It's the old 80-20 rule that every church talks about. And that's the problem here that Paul is addressing. The church was good at taking care of its own, but some of the members had stopped working to simply wait on the return of Jesus. They, they became a burden to the church. And here's what happened. They got into a place where they said, the young people can do it. I've done my time in that ministry. I've served my years in that area. It's time for somebody else to take the reins. I'm gonna sit back and coast until Jesus returns. And there are three principles here about how followers of Jesus Christ, no matter where you fall on the spectrum, that we should all be diligent workers and not lazy Christians. And here's the first thing that he says. If you're a note taker, backs out of your worship guide, you can jot down a few thoughts. Number one, Paul tells us to invest in honest labor. He wrote this, look again in verse eight. We did not... We were not idle among you. We did not eat anyone's food free of charge. Instead, we labored and toiled, working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Now, we know from the study of Scripture that Acts chapter 18, we, we learn that Paul had a marketable skill. Paul was a tent maker. And so the believers in Thessalonica were poor and right, that, that was the, the burden of the church, the, the crisis in the church, the poor and the hungry. And he knows that, that this area and this church and the believers here are poor. So Paul sets up shop in order to make tents. It's what he's good at. 
And so he shows them the value of good, hard work. And most of the people at that time living in the first century thought that manual labor was a little bit undignified. Their poets and their philosophers had a warped view of work. Maybe you know some of the words from Homer. Homer would say, the gods hated men and the way they demonstrated their hatred was to invent work and punish men by making them work. And so some of the believers, even some of the non-believers, they, they thought hard work was beneath them. And some Christians, even in our society today, see work as a horrible burden. They hate their jobs. That's why Americans love to say TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. According to a Gallup poll taken in June 2013, 70% of Americans hated their jobs or they were so disengaged that they just try to make it through the day to simply get paid. Only 30% of American workers say they really like their job, they're into their work. And since this study is from six years ago, no doubt the percentages have simply gone up and the disgust with work has simply widened. We even like to write songs and sing songs about job satisfaction. Some of you in the room remember the mamas and the papas when they sang Monday, Monday, can't trust that day. And some uninformed Christians still seem to think that hard work was part of the curse God put on humanity after Adam and Eve sinned. Now let's talk about that for a moment. Because I think that's a theological confusion area for many Christians. The Bible makes it very clear to us, church, that God put Adam to work in the garden before he sinned. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To work it and take care of it. Before Adam sinned, God had established work. So God did not curse Adam and Eve. He didn't curse work. But God did curse the ground. And so from that time on, Adam and Eve had to do what? Work harder than they should have to work. They were going to have to work from creation. From the time God breathed life into them, they were going to work and take care of the garden. But because of sin, work became harder. Think of it like this. Rather than just simply taking care of the garden and being in the majestic presence of the Lord in the Garden of Eden. Now there are thorns and stickers that they have to clear the way before they could plant. There are weeds that grow up that now they have to pull year round and working became backbreaking and sweat producing. A work that it was never intended to be that way. So work is good. But the reason work is often hard is because we live in a sinful world. And all through the Bible, God commends the value of honest work. The fourth commandment was about taking a day of rest. But we sometimes miss the point of what we should be doing the other six days. God said in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 and 9, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Remember that day of rest. Six days you will labor. Six days you will work and you do all of your work in those days. But on the Sabbath you rest. And so God tells us clearly in Scripture, work is good. It's something we should do. Six days of the seven-day week. God did not give us four days of rest a week. God gave us one. And even though this message is, 
is about working till he comes. It's a warning against laziness, and we're going to talk about laziness in just a moment. We all know that there are some people in the room this morning who are on the opposite side of the spectrum from lazy. They're what we would call workaholics. And I want to give a word of warning to the seven-day-a-week workaholics. And I have to tell you, before I give you a warning, let me introduce myself to you. Good morning, my name is Jason Ashley, and I am a recovering workaholic. And if you are a workaholic this morning, you are sinning against God. You are sinning against your family and against your body. God designed humanity to function best with a balance of work and rest. Take a Sabbath and take it seriously. And you might be thinking this morning, this message is not for me because I do not have a job. You might not have a job you're getting paid for, but you have a job. You can still serve the Lord. Retirement is a Western word, not a biblical word. Maybe you're a student this morning. Our college students are here. And there's another kind of labor besides manual labor. There is mental labor. (laughs) And so these principles apply to students and retirees and those who are in the workforce. Legendary football coach Vince Lombardi, who the Lombardi Trophy at the Super Bowl is named after, Lombardi said these words, the only place success comes before work is in the dictionary. And Thomas Edison is given credit for saying, we often miss opportunity because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. My friends, wherever you fall, whatever age, whatever generation, we are called to work until he comes. An oxymoron is a lazy Christian. You have something to contribute work-wise that is valuable to the kingdom of God. Invest in honest labor. The second thing he tells us this morning is in verse 6, and he says, laziness is a disease. He says in verse 6, we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother or sister who is idle and does not live according to the tradition received from us. I thought about right here in this section to talk about the five symptoms of laziness, but I was simply too lazy to look them up and tell you about them. So instead of that, I thought I'd tell you about the story of the world's laziest man. World's laziest man found a magic lamp, and a genie came out of that lamp and granted him three wishes. Lazy man said, I want a horse, a sumo wrestler, and a squirrel. And poof, the genie provided all three of those items. And the genie said, I just have to ask you, lazy man, what are, what are these items here for? Lazy guy said, well, I'm, I'm tired of walking everywhere, so I want to ride the horse. And the sumo wrestler is, is here to lift me up onto the horse because I don't want to have to climb my way there. And the genie said, okay, well, I kind of get those two things, but why a squirrel? And the lazy man said, I need someone to go to start the horse. That's the world's laziest man. And you know, we we laugh at lazy people. But a lazy Christian is a contradiction. Lazy Christians freeloading off the working believers in Thessalonica motivated Paul to use some of the strongest language that you will find in any of Paul's writings. And if you spend time With lazy people, you might catch what they have, laziness. And laziness is contagious. Hear me. The phrase, and we use this a lot in our society, 
The phrase, idle hands are the devil's workshop, is not in the Bible. That's not a biblical statement, but there are some truths to that statement. If your hands are busy working at a good job, if your hands are busy being active in the work around you and what God is doing and join him in it, Henry Blackaby, then there's not much chance or little chance that the devil is going to mislead you. But Ben Franklin is given credit for saying something like this. It is the working man who is the happy man. It is the idle man who is the miserable man. In the King James Version of Scripture, some of you use that, laziness is called slothfulness. And our Catholic friends in the Catholic tradition, sloth is considered one of the seven deadly sins. And Dr. Charles Stanley, some of you watch him on Sunday mornings before you come to hear a short bearded guy. Charles Stanley makes this observation about slothfulness, about laziness. Stanley says, work is not a curse. We've identified that. But he says, work is a gift from God. The worker who never shows effort, energy, or enthusiasm is not living the godly life that God created him to live. In the word of God, Stanley says, his approach to life would be known as slothfulness. And slothfulness is a landmine with the potential to destroy all that we are and all that we seek to accomplish in this world. And there are many proverbs in the book of Proverbs that speak of the dangers of laziness, the disease of laziness. For instance, we read in Proverbs Chapter 10, as well as Proverbs 19. Idle hands make one poor, but diligent hands bring riches. Laziness induces deep sleep, and a lazy person will go hungry. And so the apostle Paul writes that lazy Christians were a double threat. Did you catch it? Verse 11. For we hear that some among you who are idle are not busy, but busy bodies. They're a double threat. They're not doing anything, but they're sticking their nose into everybody else's work. And he says, laziness, idleness, slothfulness, it's a disease and it's contagious and you have to be careful who you're with. The last thought this morning is that excellence is an example. Invest in honest work, honest labor. You have a job that you may or may not be paid for. You have a job to do. Laziness is a disease. It will trap you if you fall into that. And now he says excellence is an example. Paul explained why he made these tents in Thessalonica. He says, we did this in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to follow. We did these things so that you would imitate us. And so he's trying to set a good example for them by working hard. He, he's trying to show them, don't become idle. Don't, don't sit by. There's things you can do. You've got gifts and talents. And we need those. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we should be the kinds of workers and the kinds of students that serve as an example of excellence to others. Paul wrote in Colossians 3, chapter 23. I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 23. How Christians should excel at their work. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. But he goes on to say, because sometimes we put a period there, but there's a comma. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Jesus Christ you are serving. So your job, 
or, or school, if that's your job, or retirement, if that's your job, is a platform that God has given you to serve him. That's what he says in Colossians. It's your ministry. It's your investment in the kingdom. And the way you glorify God in your service, your work, your school, is by putting everything you have into it. Working, serving, investing with all of your heart. That means that you maintain enthusiasm on Monday. <laughs> you maintain enthusiasm throughout all the week in all things. Do you know the word enthusiasm comes from the Greek language entheos, which means in God? And so the more in God you are, the more God is in you, the more work you accomplish, the more success you will have, the more enthusiasm you will display. Be honest. You don't have to say out loud, but honest with yourself. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most enthusiastic, how enthusiastic are you right now, today, about your service, your ministry, your job, or your schoolwork? Enthusiasm makes the difference between mediocrity and excellence. And the best way to show excellence in your work is to imagine that Jesus is your boss. Because guess what? He is. And Paul wrote that in the context of your daily labor, it is the Lord Jesus Christ you are serving. John Stott was a beloved British pastor and author. And he wrote these words. Stott said, the way to serve the Lord in your work is to always imagine that you are working for Jesus instead of your boss. He says, it is possible for the housewife to cook a meal as if Jesus Christ were going to eat it or to clean the house as if Jesus Christ was going to come and stay as an honored guest in your home. It is possible for teachers to educate children, doctors to treat patients, nurses and caretakers to provide care for patients, lawyers to have clients, shop assistants to have customers, for accountants to audit books and secretaries to type letters in every case as if they were serving Jesus Christ. My friends, God cares about every area of your life. Everything. He cares about your family life. He cares about your school life. He cares about your work life. He cares about your retirement life fact of the matter is a lazy Christian is a contradiction in terms we all must work until he comes back let me pray for you this morning God I believe sometimes in the uncertain times that we face it's easy for believers to sit back and wait for your return, knowing with great hope that we'll speak.